So if you rewind back to why this country had an auto industry and your homeland of South Africa has a very strong and buoyant auto industry. In fact, the auto industry in South Africa is a net exporter. Uh, if you listen to one of our earlier podcasts from 2020, where we interviewed uh, the team of the ex-managing directors of uh, Nissan in South Africa as to how big the auto industry there and how it serves and supplies the rest of the world, as well as the, their own country and own market. With 30 years experience in auto logistics and state-of-the-art locations in five major Australian cities, Precar Fleet Services are a premier all-in-one solutions provider for commercial vehicle fleet operators, leasing companies and original equipment manufacturers. Please visit precar.com.au and click on the link to Fleet Services. So it's interesting when you look at the auto industry and the real benefits to a country. And it's almost like we sort of forget why this country, in particular Australia, has an auto industry. The learnings were very much from the austerity of World War II. We're a, a remote location. I, I footnote this with some of the people who have made an impact on my life, namely my trade school teachers, who sat me down as a young apprentice and explained why we have an auto industry way, way back when I was literally just a 16-year-old. And my eyes just lit up thinking, wow, if, if that's what it's all about, you know, I really want to work for a car company because there's so much you can do. It's, it's, there's, the career paths are immense. There's just so much choice that you can go and you can be technical, you can be marketing, you can be procurement, you can be engineering, you can be design. There's so many parts and logistics. There's so much you can do in a car company because they're so big and there's always something happening and there's always innovation and it's passion and it's fun. And that's what car companies are all about because they produce great things. We often used to say when we'd be visiting car dealers about you know, how cool it is to be in the auto industry because you've got a new model coming all the time. It's always something new. And we'd sort of joke and say, well, it beats selling washing machines. Well, washing machines, okay, not being disrespectful to washing machines. There's some pretty cool spin cycles out there. But in the main, autos are fantastic because there's always something new. And there's always something, there's a lot of new things happening right now. So when you look at the industry, particularly in this country, why do we? Why did we have this brand called Holden? Why did this this whole strand car manufacturing really become a thing? Now we had many, many manufacturers here pre World War II. There were lots of smaller manufacturers, and what usually was happening here, you'd have chassis coming in from say overseas, uh, components and bodybuilders. So you'd have American chassis with powertrains coming in and local bodybuilders fitting bodies to them. And then sort of a bit of refinement, but it was very much CKD, complete knockdown stuff with a bit of local customization from the body perspective. But one thing this country learned through the austerity of World War II is when shipping lanes were challenged and poor, poor little Australia was isolated out here. You had merchant ships that were being sunk and a lot of ships coming this way because the war effort was swung into Europe and Asia and the Pacific, et cetera. So you need the the leaders at, of this country at the time realised that hey we need to invest in the future. They saw the car assembly plants in Europe getting immediately taken over and pivoting from making cars to making munitions, making military hardware, uh, pretty much uh, in a very short time frame. Because if you're an assembly line that can build a car, you can turn that assembly line into building planes and all sorts of things, tanks armoured vehicles, you name it. That's assembly line can pivot quite quickly to do that. So that was one of the key sovereign risk elements that a car company made sense. And I'll use an example of, of Renault, for example. Uh, Louis Renault uh, was very reluctant to hand over his factory uh, to the Germans when they invaded uh, France. So, But in, he's more reluctant to actually have them destroy it so he wanted to protect that, that factory because he knew what would happen is the Nazis would take all that gear and take it back to Germany to build what they needed to build. So unfortunately, he was then seen to be a collaborator and lost his life as a result of that uh, after the war. So it's funny how the auto industry can pivot into different things for, to protect the country. Now, when we look at Australia, Australia was isolated. So Ben Shifley was a prime minister of, at the time in 1944. And he challenged the local assemblers of cars here to say, we need to have an Australian car that's actually made here, not just chassis and bits and pieces that imported and put together. So that's where the 
challenge went out to all the car companies and General Motors answered that challenge and said, we'll make a car, which is the FX or the 48215. And that car was immensely successful. So when you look at how that Australia embraced that, that was all about employing a whole heap of people in a whole different assets and building the skill base of this population that was growing. So you got you had people coming to this country, a lot of refugees came here, uh, migrants came after the war. So they needed jobs and the auto industry was the perfect place. It was booming, you would need a mobility and it was at a time when, okay, we needed to invest because we learned that we need to have hard metal skills that the developed and advanced economies have. So that's the backstory as to why Australia had an auto industry. And it's funny how we forget because when you just look at the back end, you think, oh, it's all about just having a car. So if we just get cars from overseas and import them, they'll be cheaper because when you had an auto industry, you had protection to a certain extent. And there was a bit of resentment that built up over time. But we forget that there's passion for all the countries that make cars. There is an underlying passion for their vehicles. If you look at Italy, the passion for Alphas, the passion for Fiat's. Uh, the French, the passion for Renaults, passion for Peugeots and Citroëns. Even though Citroëns are huge volume, it's a beautiful car. It's got a lot of passion to it. The US, we know the, the Chevys, you know, God bless them. They're fantastic cars. Ford, very strong. Uh, and Chrysler with those unique vehicles, you know. Here you have passion for those products in those countries. And then you've got the Japanese brands, you know, the, the Toyotas, the Nissans, the Hondas of the world. You know, these people, you know, they're, they're diehard. They're, they're, they're entrenched in the community. So it's interesting when you have a country, and look at Sweden, you know, Volvo, you know, a tiny little country like Sweden still makes Volvos. So here we have a, an industry that we're quite happy to walk away from. I'm keen to get your thoughts on that, John. Well, I think, Mark, you make a very good point from purely a strategic point of view. And I think what we're seeing now, just looking at what's happening in the Red Sea, how easy it is for a country like Yemen to close off the Red Sea. Previously, if you wanted to do some sort of embargo or close off a big sea area, you would need a, a very big deep sea navy. You would need a lot of ships. And running a fleet of big ships like that costs a huge amount of money. So you could only do it if you had a very big economy and was able to fund that sort of operation. But what we're seeing is Yemen is one of the poorest countries in the world, and they can very easily take control of the Red Sea. And being an island, and we interlocked by the sea, it poses us a lot more risk now that it will be very easy for even a very small country to hold us hostage. So I think from a Purely strategic point of view, it makes a lot of sense to say, is automotive manufacturing a very important part of Australia? And should we relook at reintroducing manufacturing back to Australia? I, I, I agree. Like, you know, I, I'll declare my interest here. I actually think it is great for jobs and it's great for career paths. You can be in the auto industry and have four or five different careers and still be, be within the same industry. And you can still be driving your passion. And, and what you'll find is most people who worked in car companies and some of the bigger ones here are super passionate about A, the products, B, what they do and, and how they go about it. And they're ultimately professional in how they go about it. So when you think about it, in and I'm not talking about the heyday, if, if you really want to go to the heyday in this country, and, and there, were, there were issues where we maybe had too many manufacturers early days and the button plan came in to rationalise the, the industry so that you, it, it makes sense to produce the right number of cars. The problem you had is you, in the main, there's a, there's a round figure that you need to be able to produce 200,000 cars out of a plant to make it viable. Now, that's never going to work with the with the market share that you've got here. You can't just make one car and 200,000 of them to service this right economy. And this is where export has to come into play with whatever you make. It has to make sense to be able to export it. Gone are the days that when Holden had 43% market share, uh, back in 1957 with uh, with their product after being launched as the Australian car. And that was a huge success. But then the share dropped afterwards as more competitors came into play and you had better vehicles to choose from. So we're a very diverse car park of vehicles and, and manufacturers, et cetera. So it makes, it's difficult if you were to say, well, we're going to make a car for Australia only. 
you need to make a car for the world. And that's when shipping costs come into play, reverse shipping costs and subsidising those shipping costs. If you're serious about your industry, you're going to have to subsidise in some way, shape or form. Now, those subsidies come back to you in taxation from those employees. Now, when you think about it, in 2010, we're not talking about the high point of the industry, we're not talking about the low point, but still 2010, the industry was coming out of the, the GFC. So you still had three major manufacturers. That was employing, they were employing around 400,000 people directly and 100,000 indirectly as far as suppliers. Now, that's, those numbers are almost cliche because people used to say that and no one really thought, oh, yeah, 100,000, who cares, no big deal. Those 100,000 are mum and dad businesses. Those 100,000 are also large corporations. There's not just one or two people in those 100,000 businesses that do the work. Some are, some aren't. And there's a skill set and a skill base, tool making. You know, if we really are isolated and need to resort to be self-sustainable, we've lost that skill set. So where are all the tool makers? If we need to have injection molds and do all these other things that we, that, we, that we used to do back in the day, they've all gone because the demand for it wasn't there. The auto industry provided a floor in the market as far as volumes for a lot of these businesses that then could do additional fabrication and manufacturing for other industries. But you needed that baseline of what the auto industry provided for those other suppliers to give them viability to be able to supply other industries. And that's where you get this knock-on effect. So the auto industry is, and as we talk about everything with this podcast series, nothing is a silo when it comes to automotive. It is all interconnected. It's inter interconnected to the community. There are interconnected business units of every sort that come into play here. Recycling, new, used, all this stuff comes into play with the industry the parts side of things, the manufacturing side, and then the interconnectivity between that finance companies, interconnectivity with other suppliers, with primary producers. Even. So, uh, and mining companies, steel manufacturing, steel works, all these elements come into play for what a, a proactive government does to ensure that it has some sort of manufacturing base. Now, the auto industry, the visionaries that were in government way back in the 1940s through a very austere time, really set us up for a very good period of time. The point you make, which is really valid, is that the automotive sector, with that engineering research skill set, whether it's molding engine components or whatever it is, provided a base so that if any other manufacturing business would look to come to Australia to invest, that base is there, and that would attract those sort of manufacturing businesses to consider location in Australia. So business grows business. Now that that's all taken away, you lose all that. So companies won't even consider Australia's manufacturing business because you don't have all those peripheral businesses to support the industry. So I think you make a really good point about that. It's interesting, you know, John, the, because you think of engineers, and engineers are very clever people. Now, if you reduce the pool, and you don't just have to work directly for a car company to be an engineer, you can be an engineer for a wheel manufacturer. And that wheel could be used in automotive, could be used in cycling, it could be used in all sorts of other elements. It could be in aerospace. So this is the beauty where you, the auto sheets underpins all those other industries by giving you a pool of talent not just engineers, let's talk about trades because, you know, auto techs, you know, if you have the OEMs and the other uh, suppliers that have their basic trades and techs that come through from grassroots and work their way through or still maintaining their positions of, of, of grassroots techs, we need them. You then get this bigger pool of people that you can actually maintain your, your, uh, your vehicles rather than have to rely on importing semi-skilled people from overseas and and hoping that they stay and, and do what you need them to do. It's, it's giving career paths for people. The other side of it is the taxation benefits because these people work, they pay tax. When we look at, the, oh, but we subsidise the auto for X. Well, we subsidise a lot of things in this country, but do those things that we subsidise give us benefits? You know, we 
okay, there's a little bit of there was a bit of protectionism. Well, the protectionism all disappeared. Now we're not saying that we need to have the industry where it was or what it was when you had so many manufacturers. Right now there's a there's a pivoting opportunity because you've got some niche cars that you know you could be a player. I know there were a few organisations that were looking at the, the remnants of what was the Australian auto industry to to make niche vehicles that are high in profit and where you can you need a return by exporting. This is where you know we need there needs to be government support. For export programs, why wouldn't you do that? We know that we've got a situation where you've got other countries that that support and, and subsidise the industries because they need they want volume. Now, no secrets that China does that. No secrets that a lot of the uh, other Asian markets do that. So you know we've got we, we've given away our skill set. Like fast forward thirty years from now, why would you want to be an engineer in this country unless you were doing something in aerospace with the limited opportunities there? Because if we're going to continue to buy stuff offshore, what else is left? You can't just have plumbers and builders because eventually, yes, you need them to build the houses. Yes, that's great. We need them to build them. But if that's all you've got is plumbers and builders, you've got nothing else. What happens when you actually meet the equilibrium of, of supply, but you've got no one to fix anything or you're paying ridiculous prices for vehicles because everything's at the mercy of the market? as to what it's prepared to supply you. We learned the hard way through the global or through this pandemic. Australia was the last point of call for, to send cars. All the other markets looked after the domestic areas first. Now we've got plenty coming our way. Yes, that's great, but that's because the other markets have slowed and the overcapacity is now coming our way. But longer term, what is the future and why do you need to invest in a, in a sustainable auto industry? You've got to have government support, and that is the key. And I think, Mark, that's also in terms of that peripheral type businesses, that also overflows into your universities and your research departments. So having a manufacturing industry here, you would often get collaboration between the universities and business working on different problems, and that often ultimately results in other creation of other types of businesses and other types of manufacturing. So it all rolls over and continues to build. It's, it's not, not a silo type of effect. So it has a huge positive impact in the market. Absolutely. And there's accountability for the manufacturers that are here or that, if that, that whoever was to play here again to make sure that they make the products that meet the market here or meet the market somewhere. That is the key. You don't have to sell all your cars in Australia unless if you've got a sustainable export market. Now, what killed the Australian market here was that obviously the dollar was super strong, parity. You had products that weren't necessarily where the market was going because you had heavy, heavy reliance on a D-segment sedan, which the market was going away from. That was the only profitable car to be made here. And that's why when the decision to pull out because the Australian government failed, ceased supporting it, that's sort of forced the hand of the manufacturer. So let's close this plant down as to it. But you think of what we had here. We've had designers, we've had engineers, and we've had like large quantities. So you had huge career paths, but you had a talent base. The talent is still here. And it's great to see the talent is still doing certain work globally for other manufacturers. And that's really cool that we've still maintained some of that. But it's not what it was. 10, 15 years ago. And if you want to look at the high water mark, the high water mark was probably around the 2000s, where, where that was a very buoyant local manufacturing, very competitive time. You had four car companies manufacturing here at the time and investing in new models. The last new model investment would have been 2006 with the VE. That was the last full, full blown car from the ground up that was invested. It was $1 billion way back then. So it gives you an idea of what's involved when you've got to foreshadow or foresee what the, the market will want. And at that time when the, all the engineering with, and design was being done, that was the car that people wanted. By the time it hit the market, we knew everything was, had really moved to small cars and then ultimately SUVs and pickups. So now we know where the market's going. It's going EV. We know pickups are a big thing. We know SUVs are a big thing. So there's a bit more clarity. So is it time for a business case to be done again? and invite who wants to be a manufacturer in this country 
albeit on a smaller scale, but let's see what we can do to attract and retain an organisation that's going to give some sort of pride back into what we have here as a country. Works well in South Africa. They, you guys seem to make it work exceptionally well. I know the US, uh, it's, it's, it's a key focus there. There's been a bit of movement off you know, down south into Mexico, but there's still a, a drive for more manufacturing back in the main part of the US. I think giving some sort of support to attract those people into it. And I think there's no harm to give it a little bit of protection. I know that everyone talks about free trade in it, but we have to look at what's right for Australia and how are we going to create jobs for Australia. And that's the important part. We need to look after ourselves and what is the benefit of our society. Because if you look back in the 70s and 80s, if someone left school, they knew they could get a job in a manufacturing area at at a plant or a, a factory there was a good chance they could pick up some type of work. But now it's really difficult for youngsters coming out. Unless you're in an academic sort of field, if you're on a hands on top, you can become a tradie and that's all. Whereas a good type of manufacturing job was always available for, for many people. So I think it does a lot of good for society and offers a lot of stability and creation of a Good, solid middle class. Absolutely, John. And this is where we, we just, it's funny, if you don't study the past and learn from it, uh, you know, you, you, uh, uh, as far as history, you're doomed to repeat it. So uh, Australia was in dire straits before World War, during World War II, and through the visionaries that were in government at the time, uh, you had a, the same government that was saying challenging to do this, have the Australian auto industry also challenged to build the Snow Mountain hydroelectric scheme. Now, rewind back to 1945, electricity was only, what, 40 years old at that point. And it was still being rolled out to a lot of households in, in rural areas. So, yeah, that's huge visionary abilities and, and capabilities that were done. So why is it that we're quite happy to give it away and have a reliance on the mercy of the overseas markets. And I think mentioning that too, Mark, very important part of that Snow Hydro scheme wasn't about the economic viability as a business project. It was a project to create jobs for people after the war because I knew they had so many soldiers coming back. So that was part of that, was to create jobs and create stability in the market and provide electricity for everyone at the same time. So it covered a, a lot of good things in both ways. And you know the other irony of it, John? The Snowy Mountain Scheme gave birth to Toyota's legendary status in this country. So the Land Cruiser earned its reputation as the unbreakable vehicle in the Snowy Mountain Scheme. So you've got, once again, you've got, the irony is not lost that you've got the Holden starting with the challenge to build the Australian car, and Toyota, the, the legacy and legend of Toyota built on the back of the Snow Mountain Scheme, where Tease, the, the contractor who built the Snow Mountain Scheme, went to Japan and got these new things that were a bit untried called Toyota Land Cruisers, because before then it was Land Rover, uh, the English Land Rovers, or to a lesser extent the Jeeps. But the Land Rover was the, the was the vehicle, and they tried these things called Land Cruisers, and they were proven to be very good and very reliable. And look at where that reputation stands now. So it's interesting when you you think of how government policy can affect the auto industry. There's two classic cases of big thinking that contributed so much to a car brands here, but b society and the auto industry as a whole. It's always a controversial subject as to who killed the car industry in Australia. Was it the car companies? Was it the the government? Or was it a combination of both? Keen for your thoughts on this one, leave it to you, John. Yeah, I think, Mark, it's a great point. I think we've reached a stage now where it's not who killed the automotive industry, but who's going to bring it back. I think there's a tremendous opportunity. And purely from a strategic point of view, it makes such good sense. Thank you for listening. Thank you.